Uh, hi again. Um, in part three of this week's content, I want to draw out another two figures, the temporal figure and the risky figure. So to begin with here, we can think of how young people seem to sometimes be used as stand-ins to talk about the future, but also in our own lives, our own youth is this kind of constant presence, the way that we kind of reflect on the nostalgia of the past. So um, again, I've just kind of put some uh, pictures in of kind of pop icons from uh, my kind of, you know, 80s and 90s youth. Um, the Palais Royale there is now, the, you know, the world's second biggest KFC or whatever. Um, and you can see there in the other example here, the kind of neuromancer, this kind of, um, this kind of cutting edge of youth culture and technology and things like that are often kind of seen as what's going to happen in the future. The, the cyborg in particular is a, is a key, um, key uh, representation of that. So when I say they're invoked as a proxy for the future, um, this is a kind of form of effect that there's see, the, the constant moral panics about young people that I've been talking about seem to be often about like the moral future, that if young people aren't, you know, trained or socialized into be a particular um, way of being now, that means the future itself is going to be under threat. So if young people in the future are good, it means that the future will be good. But of course, the future is pretty intangible, it's unpredictable, but it seems to be a constant present in our lives. Like we, we have notions of planning and ambitions and hope and these kind of things that we um, often are kind of embedded in the way that we make choices are about setting ourselves up to have a kind of, you know, hopefully relatively happy future. So just like the past, um, the, the future haunts the present as well. Um, and young, think, young people are used as um, kind of stand-ins for the future a lot, I think, in the way that kind of the discourse around them and the anxiety of the future is presented within media and politics. Um, and this is particularly the case as our existence seems more increasingly precarious and insecure and, and, and the rise of anxiety and stuff like that as kind of links into the risk society thesis. So an example of this is research that um, I was involved in in Narrabri about land use. Um, where we were asked to go out there by the Department of Primary Industries and, and do a study about you know, what the people's attitudes towards land use and what they made of the future. And quite often, you know, the, the, the adults in the community would kind of use young people in the stories and the answers they would give us to kind of talk about um, what they thought the future would be. And, the, you know, and what was happening at the time is there was... Um, uh, there was a kind of huge uh, new industry coming into town. Some of the town was wanted to happen, you know, others didn't. And there was kind of a split down the middle. And so people that wanted it to come to town were saying stuff like, um, we, we need Santos to come to town to provide our kids with jobs. Otherwise the kids leave town and that means that the town has no future. On the other hand, we had other people say that if Santos comes to town, it'll destroy the land and that means the young people here will not have any land to take over and that will destroy the future. In both of those kind of almost opposing arguments, young people were used as a proxy for the future. Their interests, their presence on the land or their presence in town was kind of a way of people explaining um, what they wanted in the future. So while young people are standing for the future, what well, I think they also stand in for the past. And they stand in for the past, I think, in our own lives. Um, you know, often when people, once they get to a certain age, get together, you know, have a few drinks or whatever, they start, you know, remember when we did this. And it was, it tends to be stuff when you're younger, um, when you're seen, or you at least feel like you had less responsibilities and those kind of things. So while the future is kind of always effectively present, so is the past. It's often about nostalgia. There's often a kind of melancholy about how things were maybe better in the past. Back in my day, you hear these kind of terminologies all the time. And so our own youth is a kind of absence, absent presence in our lives. But we often kind of over-romanticise the past as well. We usually look back through rose-coloured glasses, I think. Um, and you can see this, I think, play out in some um, moral panics in particular where you know, older generations tend to look at the younger generations and say that their music sucks and, they, you know, they don't know how to do politics or, you know, this happens within, say, feminist debates where there seems to be different waves over time and they start to come into kind of conflict with each other. So in terms of the temporal figures, I think youth in this sense can both stand in for the future and the past. 
The fourth figure I want us to kind of think about is the risky figure uh, that I've touched upon already. And this is again, comes out in terms of moral panics as well. Um, and this kind of leads to the, the construction of the at-risk figure, the young person that needs experts in their lives to be protected, so they, they're protected from various social ills or individual problems. And then there's the figure of the risk-taking youth um, that needs to kind of grow up and be more responsible and that kind of thing. These figures are both very prominent in youth studies itself. I think uh, much of youth research kind of um, uses a figure of youth that matches um, one of these. Um, the representation of the at-risk youth is kind of a key mobilisation to, you know, help protect young people to make their lives better. But again, this kind of um, leads into some of the problems that Kelly points out in terms of artefacts of expertise and how being, say, maybe defined at at-risk becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what that means is that, you know, there seems to be... Um, more recent research that shows that if you define it at risk at an earlier age, it seems to mean that you're much more likely to be come into contact with authority figures and be institutionalised. And those things in and of themselves can have detrimental effects to your opportunities and life chances. So this kind of uh, resonates with Becker's labelling theory, um, who talked about, you know, uh, how forms of deviance manifest through labelling and it's kind of not the act of deviance itself that's the problem, it's the more wider power relations of who gets to define what's deviant and what's normal. Um, the the at-risk youth, whether it's um, you know, a naughty kid at school and, and that kind of thing, um, is, is one of the kind of key figures that youth studies is interested in kind of trying to provide um, you know, emancipation and, and solving of problems for, but there's a risk as well in terms of maybe um, uh, producing that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. In terms of the risk-taking youth, um, this uh, particularly um, correlates with psychological models of young people, um, where there's this kind of notion that they're transitioning through these norm normative moral dichotomies from being irresponsible to responsible, promiscuous to monogamous, from being a minor to being a citizen, from being ignorant to wise, to being apathetic to committed. Now, obviously, the problem with that kind of picture of a transition from, you know, uh, being more responsible or whatever um, doesn't seem to correlate a lot, I think, with what you would observe with a lot of adults' behaviour who, you know, take a lot of risks, you know, may well be apathetic, may well be promiscuous, may well be irresponsible. But this is a normative demand on young people to become something else, to become this kind of normal adult. And as um, the kind of critical work around this points out, is this, maybe there's ideological work going on here. That maybe the, you know, the, the unruly, irresponsible youth is actually a way of rebelling and we, maybe we shouldn't be growing up because um, you know, to be a responsible citizen or a productive worker or an active consumer or whatever doesn't seem to be making us very happy. Um, and you can see this through the rise of, you know, again, notions of um, insecurity, anxiety, and mental health issues. So youth studies is kind of, um, particularly from a more sociological perspective, has really critically engaged with this kind of um, psychological figure of, of youth of being unstable and risky to, you know, somehow moving towards this um, secure adult. And it's been, uh, there's been a kind of a debate within youth studies, um, you know, by psychologists, sociologists and, and many others about this notion of emerging adulthood or what it means. More recently, there's been um, concern about the kind of um, neurological models of, uh, of practice. Um, employing brain scans and stuff like that to kind of, you know, get ascertain how developed people are or whether they're more likely to take risks and that kind of stuff. And again, Peter Kelly's been at the forefront of this who talks about it means that young people seem to be increasingly positioned as like what he calls a brain in a jar and that much of this kind of neurological research seems to be done with embedded um, stereotypes in it. It seems to take the stereotype as a normal and then um, normal thing and then even kind of go out and almost prove it. So again, despite, you know, 20 years since Rethinking Youth that I was talking about in the previous week, um, Youth Studies is still trying to kind of critically engage with this model and kind of um, try and make it le the, a less prominent form in the mainstream media and, and the, the discursive ways that young people have spoken about. Okay, thanks.